All right, so um, I'm going to continue on my on my story of uh, neutrinos, and we'll we'll move on to uh, from last week. So um, I will actually. So last week we ended up at. Uh, this was kind of my last slide, which was a reminder of of all the sources of neutrinos and all the different experiments that we have uh, from the Big Bang reactors to Sun. Um, and of course, all of these neutrinos have a very different range of energies, uh, the atmosphere, accelerators, extragalactic, and we, we've gone through and, and looked at some of these. And so I'm going to now move on. We've learned uh, how the neutrino was discovered. We know something about its cross section. We, uh, we looked at how uh, neutrinos from reactors are detected. We looked at how neutrinos from, are produced from accelerators. So now I'm going to move on to um, more about the discovery of neutrino mass and neutrino oscillations. But I'll also again do it by going through the history of the neutrinos and how we learned about the properties that we learned from the historical approaches. Just again, a reminder, because this is a question that always comes up, that if you look at the energy and mass uh, 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 distribution in the universe. Neutrinos are no are not a, are not dark matter. Dark matter is 25%. Dark energy is 70%. Neutrinos are the most abundant uh, of the elementary particles known, but they're only 0.5%. So that's that's always a question that comes up. So now I'm going to talk about uh, neutrino mixing and oscillations, and we'll go a little bit through the history. So. So as I mentioned in, my, in, in this overview, going from the very lowest energy neutrinos, these are ultra cold, uh, uh, these are a few MeV that you will notice here that another a big source of neutrinos are the fusion processes in the sun. So just like fission produces neutrinos from the radioactive decay of the fission products, the sun, when it fuses, produces neutrinos as well. And the process in the sun is quite complicated. So typically what you have in the sun, most of the fuel is hydrogen. Hydrogen are two protons. The, proto the two protons will, uh, can uh, combine into, uh, into, to form helium. And there are neutrinos emitted and photons. That's the light we see from the sun and the heat. And then you can have the process then continues. You burn hydrogen. This you burn hydrogen to produce helium, it produces neutrinos, and it produces neutrinos of a certain energy spectrum. You burn helium to produce various isotopes of helium. You know, these are, uh, this is a proton is red and a neutron <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is, is gray. So this is tritium, and this is just, uh, that this is tritium, and this is a, a free hydrogen. Um, this is hydrogen, and you can keep going on. And, and more and more you'll burn heavier elements and eventually the core of the sun would become iron and our sun would go supernova. There's a process in the sun that, is a, that we study, which is called the CNO cycle, which is the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. And again, this is a diagram that shows the, the, how, you know, you com carbon can combine with a proton to produce nitrogen and then you can combine with another proton from a hydrogen and then produce oxygen. And then, and there's a cycle that goes on there and is what you will see that at different parts of the cycle, you will have neutrinos produced. And each of these neutrinos, because of the different initial and final energy states, have a different um, energy spectrum. And so there was a lot of, um, so in the 1950s and 60s, uh, something called the standard solar model was produced where uh, the, the this process was described from nuclear physics and people wanted to test whether this is true. Now, the problem with studying the sun using just uh, the light that we see from it and doing the spectral analysis of the light is that you only study then the surface of the sun, which is mostly the hydrogen fuel. The heavier fuel will go move towards the core under gravitational attraction. And so to be able to actually start studying something like the carbon nitrogen, the CNO cycle and the burning of heavier elements in the sun to understand how our sun actually works and whether our understanding of nuclear physics is correct as opposed to how, how a, a, a stuns work or how the stars work. Um, 
they said, well, the best, the, net, the best thing to do is to study neutrinos because they all come out from in a different energy spectrum and to study the energy spectrum of neutrinos coming out of the sun because the neutrinos do again to the cross section. They would go to one light year of lead as a mean free path of a neutrino, uh, one and a half light years of lead. Uh, because of the low cross sections, the neutrinos from the processes within the core of the sun with these characteristic uh, energy spectrum, um, we can detect those and we can study them and we can use them to understand the sun. So, you know, so there were a lot of, of the solar neutrino experiments. One of the most successful is what we call the Homestick experiment. And this was carried, this experiment was carried out by a physical chemist. So if there are chemists or chemical engineers on this call, this is again where uh, neutrino physics touches on a lot of things. We talked a little bit about the engineering of the high energy proton beams to produce uh, neutrinos. Here also a lot of neutrino experiments involve chemistry and involve complicated chemical processes. And so Ray Davis, uh, who was a physical chemist at Brookhaven, he in installed a large detector containing about 615 tons of tetrachloroethylene. It's a, uh, it's a cleaning fluid. And the reason again is this process we call the inverse beta decay where a neutrino is captured by a, 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 I think in this particular case, it is captured by a neutron uh, to emit an electron. So it's not captured by a proton to emit a positron, it's captured by a neutron and you get an electron and you have, you know, so 37 chlorine is then converted to 37 argon. Remember, you've added here uh, a proton, right? Remember, antineutrino plus proton gives positron and neutron. Neutrino plus neutron gives proton and electron. So you go from 37 chlorine, but you've converted a neutron into a proton. So your uh, atomic mass is still the same, but your the the atomic uh, weight the atomic weight is still the same, and the z is different. So the chlorine converts into argon. Argon-37 is an is a, a unstable isotope of argon. The stable isotope is argon-40. And then in that will decay in 35 days. Now, so now I have this vat of cleaning fluid and there's no other way of getting argon-37. Remember the argon is 1% of our air is this gas called argon, but that's argon-40. So there's no way, argon-37 is this rare isotope of argon. And there is no way it comes, there's no other source of producing it as in this vat of chlorine, but you actually have to be able to count the number of electron solar neutrinos interacting. So basically the first concept here is to count the number of neutrinos uh, because they come from all different sources, but let's first make sure they're all there. So in this process, uh, Ray Davis, he was a chemist, and so what he would do is he would take out, he would count individual at, atoms of argon-37, he knew the lifetime, he can correct for it, and then he can count how many neutrinos actually interacted in these 600 tons that were in, installed in a gold mine in South Dakota called the Homestake Mine at that time. So 1.6 kilometers underground. Again, we go underground, so we don't have radio, we don't have cosmic ray interaction. And he would actually take the fluid, bring it back to the lab. He would bubble hydrogen through it and, and chemically extract the number of argon-37 and count individual atoms of argon-37. And he ran this experiment from 1969 to 1993. It's a typical particle physics experiment. We run for decades to find what we want. And he measured 2.5 plus or minus 0.2 solar neutrino units, which are equivalent to one neutrino interaction per second for 10 to the 36 target atoms. The theory predicts that the sun, which is, uh, uh, is fusion, it produces electron neutrinos. The theory predicts that the sun is supposed to produce eight solar neutrino units. And he measured 2.5 plus or minus 0.2. So there was a deficit of 70%. And so in the late 80s, early 90s, this was called the solar neutrino problem in that we're either 
our model of how the sun works is wrong or, there's, or this experiment is wrong. So for Ray Davis, for a long time, everybody said he's a chemist, you know, this is a physics, uh, 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 this is a physics problem. These chemists, they don't know what they're doing. I don't believe he can count individual argon atoms. Nobody actually believed this result. So it sat there for a while and the mystery is, is it something wrong in our uh, experimental setup? Or is it something wrong in the solar model? And so, you know, the mystery was there. It actually turns out that, uh, that, this, not, that this is true, okay? So the Homestake experiment, this really did happen. The, 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 the solar neutrinos are there. It just ends up that there's actually a deficit of 70% and we will now, I'll tell you why. But just a reminder that uh, the 2002 Nobel Prize was won by Ray Davis and Masatoshi Kushiba in, in, in Japan for their study of this mystery of the disappearing neutrinos. We have neutrinos from the sun have disappeared. In Japan, a similar experiment was taking place. In this case, they were studying neutrinos that come from the decays of pi mesons in the atmosphere. So what happens is you have a cosmic ray, a proton, iron nuclear, very high energy cosmic ray. It comes in, it interacts with the nitrogen in the air, it produces our pi mesons, they decay 99% of the time into a muon and a muon neutrino. And then the muon neutrino, uh, the muon itself will decay after a while, it has a, a lifetime of 2.2 uh, microseconds. It will decay into two, muon, uh, two neutrinos and an electron. So you have a flux of muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos. This process is very well known. We use it in accelerators to produce neutrino beams. And so they started studying uh, the neutrinos that are coming from different directions. Okay. And this is the spectrum of, uh, this, is new, this is the flux in GV per centimeter squared per second per steradian. Steradian is a unit of solid angle. Uh, as a function of log of the energy in giga electron volts. This is the, uh, uh, the expected flux of neutrinos from the atmosphere. And what they, what they did is they studied it in something called the super Kamikande detector. And then the super Kamikande detector is basically a tank of water, 50 kilotons of water. It, this thing is about 30 meters high <laughs> and 20 meters wide. This is massive. And it was filled with, with 11,000 20 inch photomultiplier tubes, our good old photomultiplier tubes, except these were 20 inches. At the time, there was no industrial process that produced glass bulbs this large. And so a lot of these were hand blown, um, uh, these very large photomultiplier tubes. And then, of course, uh, industrial processes were used to build the photo. The, actual photocathode and the sensing elements in the photomultiplier tube. But a lot of them were hand blown and they were uh, built by uh, the Hamamatsu, which is a very large company in, in Japan. And, they, and Hamamatsu in terms of photo sensors is still one of the top companies in the world producing not just photomultiplier tubes, but all kinds of photo sensors. And the way the neutrinos are detected in this particular detector, again, it's deep under, it's in a mine, it's in the Kamioka mine in Japan. We have to go where there are no cosmic rays to give us backgrounds or cut down the background from cosmic rays is using something called the Cherenkov, uh, Cherenkov uh, effect. And the Cherenkov effect happens when a charged particle is moving, when a charged particle moves through material, it interacts, all right? And it produces, um, what we call Bram Schralong, it, it produces photons. Any charged particle uh, traveling through material, it comes into the uh, nuclear field of an uh, atom and it decelerates under the effect of that nuclear potential and it emits a photon. Okay, so there's a process called Bram Schralong that we call it a photon. In, in you know, these highly relativistic, most of these neutrinos are relativistic. And when they interact, they will produce either, if it's an electron neutrino, produce an electron. If it's a muon neutrino, produce a muon. We now know that neutrinos come in different types. It, it will produce a, uh, a discharged particle, electron or muon. And because the neutrino is relativistic, the particles are relativistic and they actually travel through water 
um, faster than the speed of light. And so remember the speed of light in vacuum is the, mat is the largest speed that we have, but the speed of light because of the index of refraction in water is actually less than the speed of light in vacuum. This is basic physics. And so you, you, you can have these charged particles traveling at faster than the speed of light. And so the photons they produce, they become what is a, an equivalent of a sonic shock wave. So it becomes this uh, cone of light that travels in the direction of the, uh, of the charged particle. And so this is an illustration of it. So in this case, muon neutrino comes in, interacts, produces a muon, and muon travels faster than the speed of light. The light is emitted at a characteristic angle called the, uh, the Cherenkov uh, angle, about 40 something degrees, uh, 42 degrees, and, uh, and, then, and so it produces a cone of light. So this is what, and that cone of light is detected by these photomultiplier tubes that are covering uh, this tank with 50 kilotons of water in it that's 30 meters high and 20 meters wide. It so happens that I can identify which neutrino interacted because electrons tend to, uh, they're lighter than muons. Their masses are uh, uh, 200 times lower than that of a muon. And so the electrons tend to scatter a little bit as they're traveling. And so their light cones are not very well defined. So an electron, this is actually uh, a data. This is an electron neutrino event. You can see it produces a circle of light and the, the color determines the amount of charge that is deposited in the photomultiplier tube. Each one of these is a single photomultiplier tube. It, it's a bit what we call fuzzy. The muons on the other hand, they are higher in mass and so they penetrate more. And as they travel, their cone is much better defined. You're emitting the light at this 42 degree angle and you're not scattering. And so they produce uh, uh, signals in the detector. So this detector is a cylinder. There are photomultipliers tubes along the sides and the top and the bottom of the cylinder. Here's my, my coat. <laughs> so imagine I open this up and then put the, put, my, uh, you know, put the cover up here, cover up there. So this is the way this is displayed. So this is the cylinder unwrapped, and this is the top and bottom uh, covers of the cylinder. And so that's what you're seeing over here in this, what we call an event display. And so by studying, uh, and you can tell the direction, of course, because this cone starts from a point, right? That's, I, I hope people are seeing my video. But so this is, this is your cone of light. It starts from a point. That means that I can tell the direction in which the particle is coming in by looking at how that circle superimposed on my detector looks like and the time of arrival of the light. So you can build back, you can tell the direction in which your particle is coming in and typically the electron or the muon will be coming in from the same direction as the, uh, as the incoming neutrino from the law of conservation of momentum. And so what they did is they studied um, um, uh, they studied the, um, they, they also can tell uh, from the amount of light deposited and the track in the detector, the lens of the track in the detector, most electrons stop. And so they can tell the energy of the electron. So they have some idea of the energy of the incoming neutrino. And so they were able to look at the number of, um, of uh, neutrinos as a function of the zenith angle. So zenith angle is you know, um, this is cosine theta. So cosine theta of one is stuff coming in from the top. Cosine theta of minus one is stuff coming in. Uh, oh, sorry, cosine theta, oh no. So cosine theta of one is zero. I don't have the axis over here, but um, so the, this is the zenith angle. Theta is the zenith angle, so people can see. So you have, neutrinos that come the atmosphere. So this, the atmosphere is one kilometer. Most of the interactions happen in the top of the atmosphere, which is one kilometer above the earth. And so you can have neutrinos coming through the earth. You can have neutrinos coming from one kilometer from above the surface of the earth. You can have neutrinos coming through in this direction. And in all of these directions, you traverse different, you different distances from when the neutrinos produced. So they were able to study uh, the number of muon neutrinos 
and electron neutrinos. So this is the number of neutri electron neutrinos coming from this different, different directions, top, bottom, side. And this is the number of muon neutrinos coming from different directions. Can somebody tell me what, what is going on? Now remember, as cosine theta, you expect this behavior. It's a, it's a cosine. Um, can, can you see what the difference is between the electron neutrinos and the muon neutrinos? Somebody tell me what you can see. This is the data. Blue is the expectation. What is the big difference between these two plots, the data here? Can people still hear me? Hello? Mary, I can hear you. So um, anybody wants to take a guess at, uh, at the question, these two plots? Can you guys hear us? Can somebody say something? Could you repeat the question, please? So the question is, what is, you know, look at the difference between the two. Can you describe what the difference is? What am I seeing in this data? So I'm plotting here the number of neutrinos coming from uh, above and below uh, for electron-like and muon-like neutrinos, and, I, and there's a difference. Can you describe to me what that difference is telling you? You see this data. You collect this data, and you're looking at this data in, the, in 1998. What do you conclude? There are some answers in the chat box. Ah. Yes, yes, but uh, if anybody who can want to speak. If, if not, I mean, we can call on the people in the chat box and say, you know, whoever answered first in the chat box, can they, can they speak up in person? Or, can I try? Uh, yeah, please. I, from my observation, I saw the electron muon for the first graph is closer to the expectation value, while for the second one is below. But I don't now know what that translates to. Excellent. That's good. Does anybody want to take another stab at the data? You, 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 you think about yourself as the experimentalist who's done this. You're studying the neutrinos coming from the top and bottom. You study electron neutrinos coming from the top and bottom and, uh, and muon neutrinos coming from the top and bottom. Um, you expect something that looks like, you know, it's cosine theta. This is just the solid angle effect. Um, but you see this data. So thank you. Uh, is it, tell me, who, who was the person who answered Tamito? Thank you. You're right. Does anybody else want to take another stab as, you know, yeah. Um, are the missing neutrinos absorbed somewhere? Exactly. So both of you are actually right. The expectation was that the number coming from the top and the bottom should be the same. Okay. It's true the neutrinos are going through the earth, but we know the cross section. Remember the cross section. Mean free path is more than a light year in lead. So very, very, very few of those neutrinos, one out of, I don't know, tens of millions, will interact. It doesn't matter if it's going through the earth or not. And so you expect to see the same coming from the top, divided as the same coming from the bottom, and the electron neutrinos, you see it. In the muon neutrinos, you don't. So this is the expectation. And again, here it is that the, the ones coming from the bottom, there's a huge deficit. Almost half of them are gone. So this is another case where neutrinos of a particular type are disappearing. Disappearing meaning whether it's the solar neutrinos where I only see 30% of what I expect and those were electron neutrinos or whether it's the atmospheric neutrinos where the electron neutrinos look fine, but the muon neutrinos, half of them are missing, those that are coming all the way through the earth. Uh, or and, and the electron neutrinos coming all the way to the sun. So this was another mystery. Where is this deficit when you're looking for uh, the particular type of neutrino? Where is this deficit coming from? So, yeah. Is there a question? 
I would just like to, I would just like to give a guess. It might not be right, but uh, was it the uh, was it the neutrino oscillation? Yes, that's right, Mayor. You're you're ahead of me. <laughs> so, but I'm trying to lead you through the data and and see how this how this story unfolded. Um, and that also gives you a sense of the very different types of neutrino experiments. So, it, so this result, this is actually the data from 1998, I believe. So at the same time, this mystery of the solar, of the missing solar neutrinos had uh, given birth to yet another experiment that also used the Cherenkov effect, which was called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. It was a water Sherenkov detector with one kiloton of heavy water. Does everybody know what heavy water is? So water is uh, H2O, hydrogen, uh, H2, uh, and uh, two, two hydrogen uh, nuclei and one oxygen. Heavy water, the hydrogen is replaced by deuterium, which is basically hydrogen, but you have one neutron, one neutron and one proton. So regular hydrogen has only a proton in its nucleus. Uh, deuterium has a proton and a neutron, and this is key. So this kiloton of heavy water, now it turns out that Canada in its nuclear reactor uses heavy water as a moderator. So they have their own technology for nuclear reactors and they use heavy water as a moderator. A moderator is what slows the neutrons down from fission so they can induce more fission. It controls the chain reaction in a nuclear reactor. Usually you can use things like graphite, but here they're using heavy water. Um, and so they, they, they got one kiloton of heavy water and the Cherenkov effects happens in the heavy water as well. And it was, it was worth about half a billion, probably a billion dollars by the time uh, this experiment was done. And they located it two kilometers below the ground in the nickel mine near Sudbury, Ontario. Now, it turns out that this nickel mine produces about 75% of the world's nickel. You can look it up between 50 and 75% of the world's nickel. And it's very deep. It's one of the deepest uh, mines. It's not as deep as the gold mines in South Africa, but close. It's one of the deepest mines in the, in the um, Western Hemisphere, uh, which, and that depth, again, produces that shielding from the cosmic rays. And the process by which you detect the neutrinos um, is an electron neutrino interacts with the deuterium and it produces an electron and two protons. And all of these will produce Cherenkov light if they're above, if they're above the Cherenkov threshold. Uh, and this is called a charge current interaction. Um, you can also have uh, uh, something called an, the electron scattering off electrons. So we have our deuterium atom, it has electrons in the outer shell, the one electron in the outer shell. So you can either have the inverse beta decay process where the electron neutrino interacts with, converts one of the neutrons in the deuterium into protons. So you have two protons and an electron produced, or you can scatter off the electron. And the cross section for scattering off the electrons and that, this scattering process is more of a physical process where you kick the electron out of the deuterium atom. Now the scattering of the electron, the key there is that um, the cross section, the probability that it, it will be an electron neutrino, of course, electron neutrino and electron, they have higher cross section. But you can also scatter different types of neutrinos. It's just that the cross section is six to one. So in the scattering, you only produce an electron. You do not get the proton signal, okay? So that's how you know that it is an electron scattering event. And that electron scattering favors electron neutrinos, but other neutrinos can scatter as well. It's just the cross sections are lower. And then you have the final interaction. It's called a neutral current interaction where any neutrino can uh, scatter, have a momentum exchange, with the deuterium and break it up into one proton and one neutron. So here we have two protons and electron, an electron with no other process. In this particular process, the neutrino does not actually convert a proton into a neutron or the other way around, what uh, a neutron into a proton, they, it just um, you know, hits the nucleus and breaks it up. There's an exchange of momentum. It breaks up the, the nucleus of the deuterium, so you have one proton 
one neutron. Typically, it's the proton. The neutron captures on hydrogen, but it's typically one proton. So you can see they're very, and this does not care what type of neutrino it is. It does not care whether it's electron neutrino or a, pro, or, or a muon neutrino. It does not care. And then you can count the number of neutrinos. And this way, essentially, you're counting the number of neutrinos from the sun, again, like the Ray, uh, Ray Davis experiment, but you're counting neutrinos where you know specifically what type of neutrinos it is, or in this case, the neutral current process, you know uh, it could be any type of neutrino. And this is how they discovered this feature called what we now call neutrino oscillations. So they measured the flux of neutrinos it, using these different processes. And you will find that the neutral current interaction, this one, which does not care what type of neutrino, measures a quantity five, which is more than, you know, uh, over two times, two and a half times more than the process that only measured the electron neutrino. The electron scattering favors electron neutrinos, but other neutrinos can contribute as well, was also gave a higher flux. And so this is the missing, you know, this is where the 30% came from. So the 30%, Ray Davis measures 30% of the expected flux because he was only measuring electron neutrinos. The neutrinos are all there. They're just not electron neutrinos anymore. Okay? It, so it can I please ask a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, please. I was just wanted to ask um, in the th in the third pro process, yes. um, is the is the neutrino on the product side the same as the neutrino in the the, the yes. reactant side? Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a scattering experiment. Yeah. Oh, it's scat okay. Yeah, it just scatters. It does not interact. It's sca okay. it, it's an interaction. It's a weak interaction, but uh, yeah. it just it's uh, a, a, it's only a scattering. In this particular case, it's called a neutral current interaction where it exchanges a Z particle. Uh, okay. And so not a W. The W is a charged particle, so it converts the neutrino into the charged lepton. In this case, uh, you still have this momentum exchange, but the neutrino, uh, it, it, it's the, the neutrino itself does not interact to, produce, to change a neutron or a proton into the other nucleon. nucleon. <laughs> right, so yes. So this is why it's called the neutral current exchange. The neutrino is the same coming in and out, just different kinematics. But the energy that parts to the nucleus breaks it up. So you have individual proton, individual neutron, instead of being bound into a nucleus of deuterium. Any more questions? Is there any questions at this point? Okay. All right. So. All right, neutrinos are, the, all the solar neutrinos are there, but the neutrinos are um, not electron neutrinos anymore. So uh, what is the process by which one type of neutrino would convert into the other? Uh, you know, one, one possible process is it's a decay. But what is the characteristics? If, if it's a neutrino, it's an electron neutrino decaying into another type of neutrino, at that time we knew there were electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos. We knew at least of these two types of neutrinos. If it's an electron neutrino converting into a muon neutrino and it's a decay, what is the implication of that? So this is the hint that at that time they didn't know and that it could be a, you know, you would need mass to decay, right? It's usually higher mass decays into lower mass or the process of decays, you, you need mass. And so this was the first indication that neutrinos were not massless. Up to this point, everybody thought they were massless. And this point is only 20 years ago. <laughs> so, so there were several options. One of them is that one neutrino is decaying into the other, and the other option was this uh, neutrino, the process, what we call neutrino oscillations. And so let's go back to some basic quantum mechanics. And uh, if you remember the, uh, the particle wave duality, do people remember what particle wave duality means from your basic quantum mechanics? The particles have... Um both particle and wave-like properties. Yes, and that was proposed by 
uh, De Broly and Louis Victor Pierre Ram. He's the he's a Duke, right? So he proposes this in his PhD thesis. So those of you who are doing PhDs, PhDs today are not what PhDs were in those days. You write a PhD, and when, when you were uh, in 1924, you have discovered a, a major property of matter for your PhD. And he was able to write down the uh, the wavelength. This is 1924 is the birth of quantum mechanics and wave particle duality. That's when those concepts came in and they become actually uh, quantitative, uh, a very uh, a predictive and quantitative uh, 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 field. And he said that the wavelength associated with the particle is given by what we now know as H bar, the Planck constant, but here I've written it out in GeV nanometers. It's 1.24 times 10 to the minus six giga electron volts divided by the energy in giga electron. Okay. So can somebody convert this into, uh, very quickly, <laughs> what is, what would be the wavelength of a proton? Does anybody remember what the mass of a proton is in giga, in, in units of energy? Rest mass of a proton in giga electron volts, approximately? You can look it up on Wikipedia, but I just want it approximated. Any, I can't see the chat, so. Um, there's no, okay, there's one guess in the chat right now. So. It's one uh, GV. Yeah, Jasper, you want? Can you it's, speak? It's not. It's nine hundred uh, mil uh, MeV, mega yeah. electron volt. Yeah, nine hundred thirty-six mm. And I also heard somebody yeah. said one GeV. Yeah, so it's to first order. It is one GeV, and so the wavelength. What would be the the wavelength in this formula? What would be the wavelength of a proton? That that would be one point two four times ten to the power minus six nanometers. <laughs> nanometers, yes. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And M is nanometer, so so it's it's ten yes, to the minus you. six, then ten to the minus nine, so ten to the minus fifteen <laughs> meters. Uh, thank you, Demito. Thank you, and thanks, uh, Hamza, and I, someone who said uh, one GV. Thank you, thank you, all three of you. Uh, so, so that's, that gives you an idea. 10 to the minus 15 is always the number we think of about the size of an uh, atomic nucleus or a hydrogen nucleus, because that's about the wavelength of a proton. So actually this idea that, you know, we, neutrinos were known from the beginning to have a very low mass compared to that, the mass of a proton or even the mass of an electron from the spectrum of double beta decay, from the spectrum of just, sorry, decay, of beta decay. And so, you know, even though in the standard model they were massless, and if you write down the standard model Lagrangian, they had to be massless, um, there was still this concept that was put together by Bruno Pontecorvo that if they have very small masses, that means they would have uh, 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 the smaller the mass, of course, the, the, the longer the wavelength, right? If you have one electron volts of mass over here, uh, your wavelength is much longer. So, uh, so Ponte Corvo proposed that neutrinos of a particular flavor um, are really a mix of quantum states with different masses. And at, since as you propagate as a wave, all right, as you propagate as a wave, if you have, you have destructive and constructive interference between the waves of, particular, of different wavelengths and you propagate at different speeds. And so he said, okay, I will stop here. There is a, there is a question. Um. Are neutrinos the only elementary particles that have uh, different quant uh, like, uh, that are a mix of different quantum states? No, actually, it turns out quarks are also a mix of different states. So quarks are not pure flavors either. The the the, the difference is, as we will see, is that 
uh, neutrinos tend to have, uh, uh, neutrinos of particular flavor tend to have um, almost equal amounts of, of two of the different mass states. Whereas with the quark, if it's a charm quark, it will have a little bit of, Katevi can correct me because I have to remember my CKM matrix now. Charm quarks could have a little bit of strange in them. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, but then, yeah. But yeah, if if, if if they are like if they are a mix of different quantum states, the, are they still elementary particles then? Yes. Yes. They're flavor eigenstates. That's what makes them. They're an eigenstate for flavor. It's a particular flavor eigenstate. They're elementary particles in that you know they're not made out of any you know they're the most we fundamental particles. But they're different quantum states. And I was always saying with quarks, you will have just tiny, tiny pieces. I and mean, you can talk about, you know, a tiny amount of the different quantum and of the different, uh, uh, the flavor states uh, are different, different mix of flavor states in, in say, a charm quark is mostly charm and very little of something else of strange. And then, of course, if you go to the uh, next generation, it will be even less because as you cross generations, they're even smaller and smaller mixes. Mm -hmm. So there is mixing among the quarks. Um, and this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this was discovered also at Brookhaven. <laughs> so there's CP violation in, 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 uh, in, the, in the parity violating experiments and the charge parity violating experiments. So, um, but with neutrinos, the, the thing about the neutrinos is their masses are very small. I mean, if you, if you, and the, which means the wavelengths are much bigger. So if a, a proton has 1.24 times 10 to the minus 15 meters in wavelength, uh, neutrinos wavelength is, is a billion times because it's less than one electron volt in mass. Right? So in, so you can write down this mixing and you can do it for the quantum, uh, for, I'm sorry, you can do it between the different generations of quarks, but you can also do it uh, for the neutrinos. And you can, you can try and work out the quantum mechanics of it. Let's say I have a neutrino of type, uh, you know, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, but neutrinos of flavor A, neutrinos of flavor B, and then they can mix into neutrinos of mass one and neutrinos of mass two. If you just do the, just write it down, convert this into here's your quantum mechanical state. Uh, remember that, you know, the, the, you treat them as wavelets. Each wavelets, if you have mass one, you have energy one, energy two, and the energy depends on the mass and the energy of the neutrino, the mass and velocity. Uh, this is all relativistic quantum mechanics. So you treat them as wavelengths and then you can calculate the probability of interference as, constructive and destructive interference as these wavelets propagate through space. So the probability at a certain time t, okay, or a certain length traveled, they're traveling uh, and, uh, at a certain length uh, distance traveled, uh, is that a flavor A would be uh, detected as a flavor B, which has a different mix of nu1 and nu2. You write this down and you will come up with this formula uh, that the probability that a flavor A converts in, is converted into a flavor B, given a particular mix for each flavor, and the mix is determined by these mixing angles. We don't know what these are, but they're there. There is a mixing angle that tells you flavor A is, and these mixing angles are basically um, uh, the, uh, the probability amplitude. So you get a formula that looks like sine squared two theta. We call this a mixing angle, but because probabilities have to add up to one, we use trigonometric, uh, these trigonometric uh, um, relations, sine squared theta plus cos squared, squared theta equal to one. So instead of having two probabilities, if I have one angle, then I preserve the, the, the fact that the amplitude squared, which is in quantum mechanics, it goes the amplitude squared, have to add up to one. So I end up with one mixing angle instead of two mixing amplitudes because they have to add up to well, the amplitude squares have to add up to one. 
So that's where we get these, we call them mixing angles, sine squared to theta, it's just the amplitude of the oscillation, times sine squared, and again, this comes from the expression of these, uh, of these as wavelets, sine squared to uh, e to the minus i e2 over t is, you can write this down as an expansion in sine and cosine, but sine squared 1.27, this is just the units working out, uh, difference in the mass squares in electron volts divided times the length traveled in kilometers divided by the energy in giga electron volts. Okay, I'm not gonna work this out for you. You may have to just actually go through and do the quantum mechanics and verify that this indeed the case. Now, if I draw this out, here is, this is actually, I believe from Wikipedia. <laughs> Here is the probability that a state alpha is, is a state alpha at a, at a distance of uh, kilometers divided by the energy of the neutrino. And you'll see that the amplitude is a sine squared to theta. That's the amplitude, you know, uh, the, the probability amplitude. So this is something we have to determine experimentally, right? And the mass difference squared is also something we would have to determine experimentally. We don't know any of these things. And so this is the famous formula that tells you how neutrino oscillations could happen if neutrinos indeed are a mix of different mass states. So if you see this, if you see the oscillation, it could be decay. At this point in time, neutrinos are disappearing. You know, they could be decaying and there were still a possibility that could be decay. Wasn't sure that it, or it could be oscillations. Those were the two probabilities. But to be able to do that, we would have to study if it's an oscillation, then it has this sine squared behavior. If it's a decay, it's an exponential decay. So I would have to study the, the appearance and disappearance of neutrinos over different ranges to be able to determine whether it's a decay or whether it's oscillation as proposed by Bruno Bontagorvo. And so there actually, we have the super Kamiokande experiment. Now this is the data from, not from 1998, but maybe from five or six years ago, um, as a function of the distance traveled divided by the energy of the neutrino. Remember, super Kamiokande, the detector can measure the energy of the neutrino and the direction it's coming from. And the direction it's coming from tells you the distance it traveled from, you know, one kilometer above the earth, which is where most of the cosmic ray interactions happen in the ionosphere uh, to our detector. And so they see this data. And then there was another experiment, which is, was placed, uh, 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 the Camland experiment, which is a reactor experiment. Remember our neutrinos from reactors? So Camland sat in the same mine <laughs> under the same mountain as Super Kamiokande, but it was detecting neutrino, anti-electron neutrinos. So muon neutrinos or ele electron neutrinos from the atmosphere, but reactors produce anti-electron neutrinos. And so Kamlan actually measured the anti-electron neutrinos coming from all the react from uh, reactors in Japan. Most of the reactors fortuitously happened to be mostly at a, a distance of 180 kilometers. Okay, so that, diff that measured a different uh, distance over energy. And this is the result from Camland that I believe was probably presented about 16 years ago or 17 years ago, because this is when I decided I would like to study neutrinos. I was studying B quarks at the Tevatron at the time, and I went then to see this, this presentation of this result from the Camland experiment. And then what you see over here, this is kilometers per mega electron volt. So here's an experiment that measures quantum mechanical interference over a distance of 180 kilometers. And the data beautifully fits a sine squared pattern. This is, for me, this was fascinating. You know, collider physics is very complicated. You're looking for a needle in a haystack. These experiments are hard to do. They're precision experiments, but the data is so simple in its interpretation, okay? I don't have to have very complex uh, uh, diagrams, or if you're studying heavy flavor physics, you know, you know things like penguins, very complex uh, uh, diagrams describing the, 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 uh, like the physics behind the production and decay and whatnot. And then extracting the signal from the data is so difficult. 
uh, uh, this was such, it's just beautiful. It's such elementary measurement where the data beautifully tells you quantum mechanics works. Particles are waves. Okay. And by the time the precision of the super Kamikande data had gotten much better. So instead of seeing something like this, which could be decay, so here are the models. Oscillation is red. Decoherence, meaning that uh, it's no longer a known flavor state, is green. And decay. And by that time, you've collected enough data that it favors the model of oscillation for the disappearing muon neutrino. Now, I can go back and I can assume I only have two flavor of neutrinos uh, mixing and I can then from this measurement over here, measure the amplitude of the oscillation and the difference in the masses. And they did that for super Kamikande and they did it for Camlan and they find different answers. In super Kamikande, if I assume muon neutrinos oscillate into just one other flavor, and you fit the mass difference squared, it turns out to 2.4 times 10 to the minus three electron volt square. And the amplitude was, uh, this here uh, given as sine squared of the mixing angle was 0.38. So I, I have the 2013 fits. These fits keep getting better, but the numbers don't change very much. When they did the same fit here, again, assuming the electron antineutrinos are oscillating to yet another favor, uh, one more flavor, they found that the mass difference squared, and it's beautiful. It's just, it, it doesn't look like there's any more flavors here, right? It's just two, uh, because it fits perfectly. This, it, it actually beautifully fits this model. Um, the mass difference square was 7.54 10 to the minus five electron volt squared. And the mixing angle was not so different, but within errors it is. It was sine squared theta was 0.3, here was 0.38. Okay. Okay. This difference squared corresponds to an oscillation scale of 15,000 kilometers per giga electron volts. Uh, this, is, this is what is responsible for the solar electron neutrinos disappearing. This scale corresponded in kilometers per, you can either write it down as delta M squared or, or, or uh, the scale, physical scale of 500 kilometers per giga electron. All right, so I'm going to stop here and say, okay, we have this data now. <laughs> we have two mass differences squared. Um, now, I think some of you already know the answer but we're looking at this data and think about it. Mm, maybe came out first Camlan results were ooh, 2005, maybe. And we also had the data from Ray Davis with, uh, with the solar neutrinos and we know the distance from the sun to the earth and we know the energy, approximately the energy of neutrinos coming in. Uh, so now you're, you're faced with this. You see oscillation, it's not decay, but atmospheric neutrinos and the reactor anti-electron neutrinos uh, are giving us two different values for the mass difference squared. So this is a hard question, but if you think about it, um, what does that tell me about the number? How many uh, neutrino mass states can I have? Minimum. This m squared minus this m squared is 2.43 10 to the minus 3 ev squared. This m squared minus that minus another m squared is 7.54 times 10 to the minus 5 ev squared. They're very different. They're like 50. They're, it's a very different uh, difference in masses. So what does this tell me that I have minimum how many neutrino mass states? Do, can I have only two? Or can somebody take a guess? Maybe three. At least three. Yeah. At least three. There could be more, but right now it looks like at least that there were at least three because then M2 minus M1 
is the smaller one, and then M3 minus M2 is this one. And for that, so the, 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 for that discovery of neutrino oscillations, which was, of, uh, uh, so we had three, three dis different types of discoveries. Uh, one was from Super Kamikande, which knew when neutrinos disappear. The second key discovery was from the uh, SNOW experiment, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, which tells you that the solar neutrinos, the electron neutrinos are disappearing, but they're actually uh, converting into a different state. And then the third was that it was an oscillation that was the reason for the disappearance, <laughs> not the decay. But for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, the Nobel Prize actually just went to Snow and Super Kamikande and the leaders of those two experiments. This was the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics where Takaki Kijita from the University of Tokyo who led the Super Kamikande experiment and Art McDonald from Queen's University of Canada who led the Snow experiment. Okay. And this is now the picture that we have about neutrino mixing. And so, um, and this is, so we have over here, so it, this, is, this is neutrino mass squared, all right? And it, so you can think about the three flavors as each flavor is a mix of neutrino masses, or you can think about it, it's a mixing matrix, that each neutrino mass is a mix of different flavors. So each mass state here is a mix of different flavor, and the amount of flavor in each mass state is given by the three different colors. So electron neutrino is black, cyan is muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. We have three different types of leptons, and we have three different types of neutrinos, three different flavors of neutrinos and three different masses. And one thing you will notice is that this mixing is huge, all right? If I was to draw the quarks like this, I would not be able to tell in each quark flavor what the, what the contamination is from the other flavor. If I, if I draw a charm quark and try to look how much strange is in the charm quark, it'd be tiny. I would not see it. So this is very, 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 very different from the quark flavor. And you can think of these mixing angles. So now we have three, three states and we will have three mixing angles. And the way you can think of these mixing angles is they tell you about the fraction of each flavor in each mass state. So sine squared theta one two, which is this mixing angle theta one two, is essentially the amount of electron neutrino flavor in mass two. Sine squared, theta, uh, sine squared theta one three is the amount of electron neutrino flavor in mass three. And by studying different neutrino oscillations, muon neutrinos, electron neutrinos, anti-electron neutrinos over different energies and different distances, I can actually measure all of these quantities. I can measure these mixing angles. I can measure the mass difference squares and these mixing angles tell me the amplitude. Right. So it turns out that in 2012, there were two major discoveries in physics. One, everybody knows about, it's called the Higgs particle. The other one was the amount of electron neutrino flavor in mass three, because that is the smallest mixing angle. And that was done by the Diabay uh, reactor neutrino experiment in China, which measured the oscillate, the disappearance of electron antineutrinos from a very, very powerful reactor. Uh, it's about 17 gigawatt thermal right now um, over a distance of two kilometers. And by measuring the, that disappearance, they were able to measure this quantity sine squared two theta one three, because it was assumed it's almost zero or it could be close to zero. The fact that it wasn't zero, it's about eight, 10%. Um, or a few percent. Um, right now it's 0 0.8, 0 0.85, I believe is um, sine squared two theta one three is 0 0.8, 0 0.085. So, um, so on sine squared theta one three, I don't remember, but I do remember sine squared two theta one three is 0 0.084, 0 0.085. You can, you can look it up. 
But this was the other big discovery in particle physics is the is this mixing angle because it's the smallest you can tell here all the other ones are pretty big close to maximal in some places maximal being you know 50 times squared theta of 0.5 50 percent so it's pretty big um and that was the that was the so in this was the net the this is was as big as the higgs uh, in terms of a discovery of a fundamental uh, pr property of neutrino physics. Now, you will notice something strange in this diagram in which the amount of flavors in each, in each uh, state actually does vary. And it does vary because if we have three, uh, three mass states, so three wavelets, three, three waveforms, it, uh, quantum mechanical states interfering with three different wavelengths, you can actually have a phase shift. Oh, Remember your electromagnetic? Okay. Oh, so we're done, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so Sorry, um, I was talking to, please go ahead. Continue. Oh yeah. I, I have one, one, uh, about 25 minutes left, no, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Okay. It wasn't about you. I'm answering some other question here. My, and yeah, no, no, I heard 1230. I said, it's already 1230. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and so this phase can vary, and it's called, uh, uh, we call it the phase delta. And this phase can vary, and it will change the mix, right? It, because it changes the uh, construct, because there's a phase, so you have constructive and destructive, it, it changes the amount of constructive and destructive interference between the different flavor states, so it changes the mix of the flavor states in each of, of, of these uh, um, um, mass states. That's why you have, it varies. So this is cosine delta from minus one to one will change the mix. And why is this delta so important? It turns out that if delta is not zero, then neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, uh, it flips the sign. And if delta is not zero, uh, this, this phase will give rise to charge parity violation or a difference in oscillation between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. And this leads into the next um, big question in neutrino physics. So in neutrino physics, we've now measured from measurements like these, we have the we know the different oscillation amplitudes, the different mixing angles, we know the different mass states. Hi, sorry, can I please just ask a question? Sure. I, yeah, I, I forgot about the concept. I, like, I was just hoping that you can remind me where you have an equation where if 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 it, if the if the sign, um, let's just go back. I think it's two slides. No, back. This one. Yeah, this this equation here, where the sign between the, the sign between the two terms <clears throat> in the first equation, if it's negative, then you have bosons, and if it's positive, then it's fermions. I'm not really sure about about, about which one it is, but then is it the same concept? Uh, no, this is not. I mean, neutrino, um, neutrinos are fermions. Yes. Yeah, so we, we sometimes use the same mathematical, um, so you're thinking about uh, the spin half and spin one particles. No, neutrinos are fermions and they propagate as fermions. They're, they're spin, uh, uh, they're usually left-handed spin, uh, 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 half particles. So it's, um, um, there is, so I think what you're confused about is that we use the, we sometimes use the same uh, formulation to describe spin states. It's not that it, it just looks the same, but it's not. It's just, again, it's just quantum mechanics and you can describe, you can use theta to mean different things. And here theta means a, 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 prob a mixing amplitude. It's not theta, which has to do with the spin. Yeah. But they are fermions and so it does come in. Okay. I'll have to go back and, and look up my spin physics to, to try and different, just make, yeah. 
but this is not, neutrinos are actually left-handed. The meaning their spin is always in opposite direction of their momentum, which is another interesting feature of them. Uh, I, yeah. And another non-Nobel Prize winning measurement, but it was also an experiment at Brookhaven Lab that determined that neutrinos have left-handed helicity. Uh, so they're, so anti-neutrinos would be right-handed, neutrinos would be left-handed. All right, so I'm sorry, I may not have given you a satisfactory answer, but no, that's it. It's, uh, the mathematically, it looks very uh, different. Uh, similar, we use, again, these trigonometric approximations uh, for uh, the mixing of, uh, of fermions and bosons. But in this particular case, that is just a mixing angle, which has to do with the number of one state in the other. We're just using trigonometry again um, uh, to describe quantum mechanics, but it's a different, different quantum mechanical state in this case, not spin state. Okay. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay. So we now have this phase delta. And it turns out that the, we, have, we, we have three generations of quarks. We have three generations of neutrinos. Uh, the three generation of quarks mix with each other. You have the three generation of neutrinos that are mixing, the three flavors of neutrinos mixing in three mass states. Um, so in both neutrinos and, and for both neutrinos and, um, um, and uh, quarks, we have a mixing matrix. And because you have three different quantum mechanical states interfering, there's this phase called delta. And we have actually measured that phase in, in the CKM matrix, which deals with the mix of flavor states for, for quarks. And so there is something called the Yarskog invariant. And the Yarskog invariant is a mixture of all these mixing angles. So there's, there's an equivalent. Usually, we, we, the neutrino mixing, we use these angles. There's an equivalent angle in the quark sector, but in the quark sector, we parametrize the mixing matrix a little differently. So here we're parametrizing the mixing matrix in terms of these angle. Again, this is a parametrization. Uh, if you write down uh, this formula over here in terms of the mixing angles between the different states, mass states, sine delta CP, which is the delta, the phase in the mixing matrix, this is something that determines the degree of charge parity violation. It's determined by something called the Yarskog invariant. I'm not a theorist, I don't know why, but I just know that this, this variable over here will tell you something about the amount of CP violation, of charge parity violation. And of course, it, delta has to be non-zero. If delta is zero, sine delta is zero, this whole thing is zero. But it is telling you something critical. It's telling you that it's not sufficient that delta be non-zero. The amount of charge parity violation in, this is a weak interaction, of course, and that's where you have charge parity violation, is determined not just by the value of sine delta, but also by these mixing angles. Now, I told you these mixing angles, other than sine squared theta one three, is pretty big. They're huge in the neutrino, in the, in neutrino world. In quark world, like tiny. It turns out that delta, if you express it as an angle, since it's a phase, is 70 degrees in the quark sector. It's pretty big, but these mixing angles in the quark sector are tiny. So if I put it together for the quark sector, it turns out the Yarkog invariance is something like 3 to the 10 to the minus 5. And for in the neutrino sector, the Yarskog invariant is three times 10 to the minus two times sine delta. I don't know what delta is yet, but it's, it's already, I have three orders of magnitude more just from the mixing angle. Now, we know this. We know that charge parity is violated and that gives rise to matter-antimatter asymmetries in the quark sector. And again, we know that from Kaon decays, which were studied at Brookhaven, that prove there is such a thing as charge parity violation, the quark sector, which also got a Nobel, one of the five Nobel Prizes in physics that we got was for the measurement of the uh, uh, K-on decays at experiments at Brookhaven Lab. 
But because the mixing angles are small, it turns out the Arcog experiment, this, this amount of charge parity violation is too small to account if you take it and you say, okay, uh, let's go back to the early universe. And these are the way to, you know, I have matter and antimatter. And there's a difference in, in, in the way, you know, uh, matter, there's this slight asymmetry in the way matter and antimatter uh, quarks and anti-quarks decay. And uh, that's enough to give quarks an edge over the anti-quarks. And it's enough to produce an excess of matter in the universe. They go back, they run the simulation, they find that this difference in quark anti-quark, um, um, which Im impacts the decay, is not enough to account for all the matter that we see in the universe today, not, not including just the visible matter. Do I understand this? No, I am an experimentalist. I don't understand what the theories do. I don't understand the cosmology. <laughs> Baryogenesis is, or you might want to ask Gopi or some of the other uh, uh, lecturers, how, did, what, how does this translate into the fact that there's not enough asymmetry for baryogenesis, which is what we, which is the uh, genesis of baryons. But because the neutrino mixing is so large, people looked at this and said, oh my God, if this, if this delta is not too small, we'll have huge charge parity violation in neutrinos. And since neutrinos are involved in, in decays, then that somehow might give rise to leptogenesis, which through the interactions of leptons and baryons will give rise to baryogenesis. Most theorists will tell you um, this connection is difficult to do, but nature is giving us a hint here. It says the mixing is so big here, CP violation as measured at the electroweak scale where we are now is big. Now, the fact that we can't cleanly connect it to baryogenesis, that's up to the theory. You cannot ignore this, this very large difference. You cannot ignore this hint that nature is giving you. And so now the holy grail, if for those of you who are familiar with the, the English, English literature and, and the search for the holy grail and the Knights of King Arthur, the holy grail of, of um, you know, the, the big prize in particle physics today is, you know, discovering the mechanism for electroweak symmetry breaking by which we have all these different quarks and all the different masses and discovering the source uh, of baryogenesis. And, and so experimentally, we want to find the answer and then we'll let the theorists figure it out. Is it true? If sine delta is not too big, is not, is not zero, if delta in the neutrino sector is not zero and it's actually a, a large angle, and we're getting hints experimented that, that might be the case, then we would have a very large charge parity violation in the lepton sector. And so experimentally, we want to know this. The theorist will tell you, oh, well, so what? I don't care. We need to find out what nature is telling us. So this has become the next big a study in neutrino physics. And the way we're going to try and measure what sine delta is. Mary, yes. could you explain the idea of the phase again? Uh, it looks like- There's confusion. Some, some people said they didn't, they didn't follow how the phase came in. Okay, so the, the idea of the phase is that you have, if I go back over here to this formula, right? e to the minus i e t, that's the, that's the quantum mechanics, right? So that's the propagation of this wave. I have three of them, all right? You have three, three waves. You don't have, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you, and that means that there could be a phase shift, right? Do people understand the concept of a, a phase shift? If, you, if those of you who are electrical engineers understand this and propagation of electromagnetic mm -hmm. waves. Okay, me here, you're, you're, you're waving. Yes. Okay. So, so the, the engineers in the, it, it, it's, the, it's an electromagnetic wave that is propagating. And because there are three waves with different uh, propagating at the same time, you, you can start out with a shift in the phase meaning that the amplitudes are not lining up. Does 
Does that make sense? And that shift yeah. in the phase is going to affect yes. the, the, this is, you know, when, when, when you have the maximum probability that uh, uh, a state A becomes a state A at a certain distance, this is maximal um, constructive interference. So these three waves, as they travel, they go through constructive and destructive interference, the three mass states at different distances. And so if there's a phase, it affects where this happens. And so this, so everybody understands that that phase is there. Now, the, the, the thing you have to take my word for it is that this phase has something to do with charge parity violation. That part, I will leave up to the theorists. <laughs> okay. But physically, the phase is understood. It, it's a phase shift between the, the, wa the, the, the wavelengths as they travel, and that phase affect the interference pattern. And that is exactly how we want to measure that phase experimentally. Um, and the phase, of course, will affect the mix of the different states, in, so the mix of different flavors in each state. So depending on that phase, you know, uh, mass state two can either have more or less of nu tau in it. It depends on the value of the phase, what the actual uh, mix is. So to measure the phase, I need to measure oscillations. I need to measure the pattern of destructive and constructive interference, the sine squared pattern. I have three neutrinos now. It's much more complicated than this formula. This formula is only if I had two states, right? When I have three states, I get this formula. And it's actually approximated as well. So, so the formula becomes much more complicated when you have three states. And so the probability for muon neutrinos oscillating to electron neutrinos is similar to the probability of electron neutrinos oscillation to muon neutrinos. And it comes, uh, and if you approximate it as an expansion, in the parameter alpha, which is the ratio of the two mass difference squared, uh, because that's small, it's about 0.03. So you can, you, can, uh, you can use a Taylor expansion uh, to write this out uh, and, and, and make it, uh, it's, very, it's very similar to perturbative QCD. You expand in terms of this parameter alpha. You'll find that this probability can be written in vacuum as um, you know, this, uh, this is the Yarskog invariant. You know, it's this product of all these, these uh, mixing angles and delta CP. And this is uh, your Yarskog invariant, but you can write it as four simple terms. So term one is the dominant term. It goes, the amplitude is given by sine squared theta two, three, sine squared two theta one, three, sine squared delta, where delta is, you know, 1.27 delta M squared times L over E. The mass difference square times L over E. And we're doing this for um, a distances of, you know, a few kilometers to uh, thousands of kilometers. So again, this is an approximation that's valid over distances from about a few kilometers to thousands of kilometers. It, it starts breaking down beyond that. And it is expansion in alpha. Yes. Uh, do do these probabilities also take take into account the uh, the probability of a mu neutrino maybe um, um, oscillating to a tau neutrino? This is specifically the probability of mu one neutrino oscillating into electron neutrino. Okay. So actually, so I I put there's some controversy in the you know the theorists don't like this. I I like this approximation because. Um, you know, I can understand the different types of terms, but here is the reference. So you can always go back to this reference by Freund and see the derivation of this formula. And he will include also the probability of, uh, so the probability of muon neutrinos oscillating to tau neutrinos, it turns out that this probability is so small over like the, the, the size of the earth that most of the muon neutrinos oscillate so that this, if you look at this value over here, this is the dominant term. These terms are all in expansion in alpha. This is the dominant term. This term, sine squared two theta one three, 
sine squared theta two three is about 0.5 sine squared two theta one three is about 0 0.08 so this is about 0 0.04 Right, so that's 4%. That's telling you that about 4% at maximum, plus these interference terms, okay? So the, the dominant amplitude is about 4% of muon neutrinos oscillate to electron neutrinos when we're talking about, uh, you know, a few GV neutrinos between two and, and thousands of kilometers. That's the approximation. So it's small over the, you know, if we're talking about Earth, Earth distances. Um, and so most of it is muon neutrinos oscillation to tau neutrinos. And then you can ignore that, the, 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 third, uh, the third flavor and just use this formula. Okay, so sine squared two theta is about one in the case of muon neutrinos oscillation to tau neutrinos. So for for G, a GV neutrino and distances a few kilometers to a few thousands of kilometers, you can just use this formula for muon neutrinos oscillating to tau neutrinos and put in delta M squared uh, three, the, the bigger uh, mass difference squared. So that's, that's the formula that describes it because the electron part is so small. Mm. Okay, so now this is the term and the, the three terms. So this term, like I said, is the dominant term there's a term which has sine delta in it, and, but it's, uh, it's the next uh, to leading order term in, in expansion alpha. And that is this term with the uh, Yaroskog invariant in it. It goes as sine cubed delta. Uh, I think that might actually be, oh, I have to check whether that is right or wrong. Maybe that's a sine squared or sine cubed. Um, then you have a term which goes on its cosine data, that's CP conserving, meaning if delta changes sine, this doesn't change sine, right? Cosine, cosine. Sine delta, if J, delta changes sine, um, uh, which it does, <laughs> uh, if, if, uh, uh, if neutrinos are anti-neutrinos, this, this is the CP violating term. So these are interference terms. And then there's a term that goes as alpha squared, where the dominant amplitude over here, so sine squared theta two three and cosine squared theta two three, uh, theta is about forty five degrees, and so these are always about 0.5. Okay, so they're really the, the things that dominate the oscillation are this one is dominated by sine squared two theta one three, and this one is dominated by sine squared two theta one two, which is the term that this is the oscillation amplitude of solar neutrinos. So this term doesn't have any deltas in it. This is, these, these two are called the interference terms, uh, but this goes as alpha squared, that's the solar oscillation. So over distances of kilometers and energy just G, 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 GeV, this is the next to next leading order term. And then you have delta, which is, you know, it's, it's a, we know what, the, what this number is. If we're talking of muon neutrinos oscillating to electron neutrinos, then sine delta, becomes minus sine delta. If delta is zero, this would be the same, the probability of the same. If delta is non-zero, the probability will be different and that's where the charge parity violation uh, comes in. There's a complication to all of this. So what this is saying is if I study muon neutrinos oscillating to electron neutrinos or actually the tau neutrinos, but it turns out that this interference effect is much bigger for electron neutrinos. Uh, from the, because of the value of the mixing angle. Uh, the, then I can actually be able to measure this. I know this number, I already know this number, I know this number, I don't know JCP, I don't know delta. So any term in delta in it, I don't know it. So this is how we can get at the value of this phase. There's a complication, and the complication is that so I'm going to build an experiment. And in this particular case, we can study either atmospheric muon neutrinos oscillating electron neutrinos, or we can produce muon neutrinos from accelerators. That's how we discovered that muon neutrinos produce muon neutrinos is that we, we produced a neutrino from the decay of a pion into a muon and then discovered that that neutrino was primarily a muon neutrino. That's how we discovered the flavor of neutrinos. 
And so we know how to produce muon neutrinos from accelerator. And so the next big experiments in particle physics right now are producing muon neutrinos from accelerator and studying the, uh, the oscillation into electron neutrinos. So the beam of neutrinos travels for many, many kilometers. It's a giga electron volt. And what sets the scale is this number over here. This oscillation is driven by this atmospheric, this delta m squared atmospheric. The solar term, like we said, really comes in over here uh, in terms of alpha squared. And so this is the, the solar oscillation contributes very little over this distance. And so over distances of given by this characteristic scale of 500 kilometer giga electron volt. So a giga electron volt, or if it's two giga electron volt, a thousand kilometer, that's where the maximal oscillation will occur. So that sets the scale of our experiments. Giga electron volt neutrinos traveling over hundreds of kilometers. Right. And that's, that's our experiment. And it's set by the scale of this mass difference squared. Uh, there's a slight complication, not so slight, because the muon neutrinos convert to electron neutrinos which propagate in the earth. And remember, we have this electron scattering amplitude and it favors electron neutrinos, so it acts as an index of refraction. We have electrons in the Earth, the neutrinos scatter off the electrons in the Earth, and electron neutrinos preferentially scatter over electrons in the Earth. And so what you do is that your mass difference square, delta, which is again a wavelength, just like an index of refraction changes the, the propagation of light waves through media, the electrons in the Earth, they change it, they, they impact the propagation of neutrinos, and they give you an effective mass difference, which is, has to do with the electron density in the Earth. So this formula becomes much more complicated. <laughs> Once you add, it's a forward scattering amplitude, and since this is an oscillation and it's interference, you have to add that in the, the impact of that index of refraction on the propagation of the neutrino mass states through the earth. And then it, this, then it becomes a little more complicated. Uh, you have this parameter A that modifies the, the, the delta term. So it's an effective, the, the mass differences, just as the index of refraction will change the effective wavelength of light, here it actually changed because it changes the speed of light. Here it actually changes the effective mass of the neutrino states. And so this, comp this becomes, so this formula now depends on uh, the mass difference squared and the sign of the mass difference squared, which we, we actually don't know the sign of it. <laughs> we don't know whether mass three is heavier than mass one. Uh, and that's called the matter asymmetry. And, uh, uh, and you still have the CP asymmetry. So when you measure neutrino oscillations and anti-neutrino oscillations, because of this forward scattering of electron neutrinos, not electron anti-neutrinos, there are no positrons in the Earth, um, they, there is an asymmetry in the oscillation that is driven by the in, interact, the scattering of uh, the electron and electron anti-neutrinos. And so that gives you an asymmetry that is different from the CP asymmetry, okay? So there's always that complication. It's a complication, but it's also a benefit because that asymmetry has to, does actually tell us whether mass three is bigger than mass one or mass one is bigger than mass three. Because that, that each of these masses have different contents of electron neutrino flavors. I know this is a little complicated, but just you look at the formula straight enough, you'll be able to measure, I can measure two things by studying these oscillations and looking at the difference between muon neutrino and anti neutrino oscillations. I can find out whether delta is non-zero and I can find out what the value of that delta is. And I can find out whether mass three is bigger than mass one. And both of these are big questions because in the quark sector, the equivalent of mass three is bigger than mass one. That's why we call it mass three. But we don't know in neutrinos whether that is the say, that hierarchy of mass states follows the hierarchy of flavor states in the quark sector. If it doesn't, that's yet another big difference between the neutrino mixing and the quark mix. So we have to measure the hierarchy and we have to measure
Now, one of the experts, now this you can write out. So some of you, if you had attended ASP, um, I don't, or most of you have used MATLAB or, you know, there are a lot of these mathematical, you know, or, or, written, you know, or written a computer program. Take this formula, write it down, and start varying delta and see how that changes. So this is exactly what I did. So this is the baseline, the distance traveled divided by neutrino energy times the probability of muon neutrino converts to electron neutrinos. And here I, I, dry, I, I plotted it as a function of just the dominant term in vacuum, right? And so you can see here, um, this is just the, the next to next leading order term, the solar oscillation term. And then these are the interference terms. And you can see they grow as a function of length over E. Now, by the time I get out here, this formula is going to start to break down the approximation. Now you can vary, right? So this is in vacuum. Let's vary delta. Delta is zero here. Now I'm going to vary delta. So again, you can see we call this the first oscillation maximum, which is around 500 kilometers per GV is where the maximum occurs. The second one occurs at 1500 kilometers per GV. So we call this the first oscillation maximum, the second oscillation maximum, third, fourth, fifth. And you can see how the, in, the delta terms are changing the probability. So the, the, the amplitude is driven by the sine squared two theta one three term, and then you change delta and it change, it's a phase and an amplitude. And again, you can see that it grows as you go to higher, larger distances divided at the G. And this is, I'm going to change the sign of delta m squared. And you can see again how it changes. Look at the black line. The black line is all terms. And then the other lines represent the change in uh, uh, the value of delta. Now I'm going to add matter. <laughs> so black is the vacuum oscillations. And then you can see here, um, I, you know, if you're traveling through a thousand kilometers, two thousand kilometers, three thousand kilometers, you can see how the it, the probability of muon neutrinos, electron neutrinos, is impacted by the presence of matter. Delta is zero. So what I need to do is I need to be able to study this in detail that I can pick up the changes in this oscillation pattern from del from the effect of delta, the effect of uh, uh, of, uh, and the effect, the matter effect. So this is, you know, this is the matter effect under different values of, so this is, this is, oh, sorry, sorry. Ah! This is neutrinos, this is anti-neutrinos. So I need to, to study neutrinos and anti-neutrinos and look at the very different the impact of delta on neutrinos and anti-neutrinos and uh, also correct for the matter effect. So if this was ASP, I would have assigned this as a as work, uh, you know, go take your root or NumPy or whatever other mathematical package you use, code this up and reproduce these curves. They're simple. All right, so I'm pretty much at the end of my time here. I did put in an exercise, uh, which is a calculation which you, you can do offline. Um, we actually published a paper on this very simple calculation, uh, which uh, uses this oscillation formula. And I ask you to prove that the rate of electron neutrino appearing integrated over a constant range of distance over energy is independent of the distance traveled. Okay. So you can see over here that the number of electron neutrinos appearing from muon neutrinos is the initial flux of the muon neutrinos multiplied by the probability a muon converts to an electron uh, given energy E and a distance L times the cross section, the interaction cross section. This is the number I actually see, observe in my detector. Now the interaction cross section is approximately linear with energy for energies greater than one giga electron. It's linear with energy. And you, this, is the, this is what it is. So I tell you, assume that flux is flat. Use only the first term in the probability. Plug that in here. 
use your uh, integration, you know, your integrals, and prove that it's a constant term. For any neutrino energy is about one GV, where this is linear in energy. And you can work it out. So this is a, a bit more complicated of an exercise, but I'd like people to do that. Right. And then you can plug in the numbers and actually estimate that the number of, of neutrino events is about constant and that, you know, depending on what approximation you use and what range of, of distance of what energies you use. It's about 20 to 30 events per kiloton per year. So if I'm going to build an experiment over kilometers to study the oscillation on the scale of 500 kilometers per giga electron volt, I'm only getting 20 to 30 events per kiloton per year. I need thousands of events. I need thousands of kilotons or hundreds of kilotons. And so this comes to the, this is the, the big experiment. This is multi-billion, it's exceeded now a cost of over $2 billion uh, to study the neutrino oscillations, measure the CP phase and the matter hierarchy. This is the deep underground neutrino experiment of which I was involved and I was a project scientist for the previous, uh, for, the, pre for the, the proposal that came before the scale online. Um, and it is basically creating a beam of neutrinos at Fermilab uh, using the proton accelerators at Fermilab megawatt accelerator. They travel 1300 kilometers and we are, we are going to the same place where Ray Davis did his solar neutrino experiment, the Homestake Mine, which is now an underground research facility. And we're going to build a very large neutrino detector there, uh, about 40 kilotons of liquid argon. And we're going to study neutrino oscillations. The experiment right now, it has of this uh, January 2018 have a thousand kilometers from 175 institutions in 31 nations, one of which is Madagascar. <laughs> so we have one African nation on this, in this experiment and they're, they're actually uh, um, contributing. All right, so this is the deep underground neutrino experiment. We're hoping to see more people contribute. I think that's, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, there's, an, there's also the Hyper Kamikande experiment in Japan that is doing the same experiment using very large water Cherenkov detector. And that, that concludes my, my, my lecture on neutrino oscillations. I did put in some slides on practical applications of neutrinos that we discussed the last time, uh, which has to do uh, of, of using neutrino detectors for reactor monitoring and non-proliferation. Um, you know, multi-megawatt accelerators that can be used, uh, that are being developed for neutrino experiments, but can also then be used to drive thorium reactors and produce uh, safer nuclear energy. And uh, neutrinos are also being used to study the, so the, the Earth core, we think has a lot of uranium in it. And so we're trying to study whether radioactivity drives the amount of radioactivity in Earth core. And so we have detected neutrinos from uranium decays and thorium decays in the Earth core. So these are called geoneutrinos and they're being used to study the geology of the Earth core. Okay, and that's it. And I apologize again for running over. Uh, questions? Mary, no, that's fine. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive uh, lecture. And uh, it's, it's, it's really apparent that neutrino physics uh, is a very huge uh, field with uh, the possibility of studying fundamental physics. And you also have a lot of applications. And it's nice to see that uh, we have Madagascar in the Dune experiment. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I mean, more questions or comments? Now the exercise that Mary mentioned, if anybody did that exercise offline, uh, that would be appreciated and you can contact Mary with your answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this exercise does actually require some sort of numerical integration. So, yeah, but it, it needs uh, it needs it needs uh, it, it will take a little bit of time to work it through. Yeah, somebody wants us to 
talk, but I think we are not hearing very well. Mir is trying to talk, but maybe if he can write down. So this is Christine. Hi. Yeah. Can you type your question in the chat? Um, we can hear you very well. Or if you have a comment. Okay, what's your question, Be here. Can you please type your question? No, I managed to get the chat. <laughs> okay, so he said that uh, he, yeah, okay, the lectures are recorded. The recording are uploaded to the same uh, Enico agenda page. So at the end of the session, the file, uh, the recorded lectures are attached there. So if you go back to the, the same, the same Enico agenda page, you should see the recording and you should see also the slides. So Mihir was saying something about NASA. <laughs> oh, NASA recently released the news that they discovered evidence of parallel universes. Uh, I'm not quite sure what, what that refers to. Um, through neutrinos? Mihi, uh, do you have uh, any link on that information? Hello, am I clear? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, the news recently announced that uh, NASA yeah, has so, yeah. found evidence. Think, let's go there. I think I, people can see my screen. Yes. Is this it? Uh, NASA's Fermi traces source of cosmic neutrino to monster black hole. This is 2018. Okay, Mihi, your 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 connection is again bad. Okay. I think that I don't think I, I mean the the there is the discovery of ultra high energy. Yeah, I Mihir, mean, just type it in the chat. We can read your chat. Um, <clears throat> I don't see his, um, yeah. okay, now he sent it, he sent it. Okay, so I don't know whether he's referring to this, uh, which is, so I, I in, in, in one of my, um, let's go back. Hello, am I clear? So, in, in, in my list of neutrino experiments? Right. No, you are not clear. So you are not clear at all. So Mary is uh, trying to explain. So if this is about ultra high energy neutrinos, there's, it's not evidence for parallel universes. What they're finding is there is an experiment called Ice Cube. And I think since I'm sharing my screen, uh, Okay, I can bring it up. So Ice Cube is the, I think people can see my screen, is the South Pole Neutrino Observatory. And it uses, uh, remember the Sharenkov effect and photomultiplier tubes? You can detect very high energy neutrinos, which can only come from particles accelerated around black holes. So black holes 
tend to have these very powerful magnetic fields and they accelerate particles to high, high energies, you know, 10 to the 15 uh, electron volts, so tera electron volts. So one of the way, so there is an experiment that is dedicated to detecting both muon, tau, and electron neutrinos uh, from these high, from these galactic sources, from the cosmic rays. Again, the cosmic rays themselves will not survive, but only the neutrinos. So if you have a pion that's accelerated to tera elect to uh, peta electron volts, um, it will decay to a neutrino, and you'll see the neutrino because it will travel to from the black hole to us. And so the there have been several very high energy neutrinos, very very high energy neutrinos uh, discovered in this ice cube experiment, which is in Antarctica, the South <laughs> Pole. Uh, it it basically it uses the neutrino interactions in the ice. So you go one kilometer deep in the ice, and then you put in photomultiplier tubes. You melt the ice in a core, and then you install photomultiplier tubes. The ice refreezes. And so one kilometer deep, you have a very large kilometer cubed, one kilometer cubed, this uh, uh, um, Sharenkov detector. And you can detect these very high energy neutrinos. They leave signals that are kilometers long. Okay, um, another question more oh, related so Mir to- says, and so, so, yeah, so there was the issue, uh, Mir says these are experiments going on laboratories. They're trying to coax an electron to their, oh, this is the Mossbauer effect. Let me see. I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, um, I would like to yeah. see or uh, hear questions directly related to the lectures uh, yeah. uh, of uh, today or last week about neutrinos. Yeah. So, Ms. B Mihir, I believe you're talking about something called the Mossbauer effect. Um, you can look it up. I think there was a result recently. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, no, we, your connection is uh, not very good. You can just type the question, please. Um, okay, so I think um, we should stop here for today. I'd like to thank Mary again for the people who have been at uh, the past AXPs. Uh, Mary has a lecture there. She's a colleague of mine at BNL and has uh, helped a lot. She's been helping a lot, uh, getting ASP students to BNL and mentoring. And, and she talked about the Madagascar in Dune experiment. So she was uh, instrumental to make sure that those people get uh, integrated. Uh, so she's heavily involved in, uh, in, the, in the ASP program. And uh, you can also see the quality of the lecture that are being given in the last week and, next, and, and this week from today. Uh, so you'll be seeing Mary uh, again and again um, as we go through the ASP uh, process. So, um, so uh, with that, I suggest that we stop uh, today and um, I will send information about the lectures that are coming up next week. So thanks everyone, and uh, in particular, thanks Mary for these uh, lovely lectures. Uh, they are really, really instructive. Thanks everybody. I'm, I'm hoping to see more people join the Dune experiment. <laughs> yeah, Thank you great. very much. It would be great if you can have more African institutes in there. But, yeah. Or maybe yeah. even join some of the experiments that are working on non-proliferation and so on, which may be a more practical. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. And Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Both, uh, both lectures were very, very complementary and very interesting, and as well this multi-physics part, the multidisciplinarity, so that was very interesting. Not only for neutrinos, but as well for people in accelerator world and any other places, so very interesting. Thanks a lot.
Okay, so, um, all right, thanks everyone, and uh, bye. Bye.